You're listening to LeaderCast, episode 109. Welcome to LeaderCast, Transforming Missions podcast with Tim Bias and Sarah Thomas, providing you with insights and resources you need to lead a movement of Jesus followers. Tim, I know that you have, I'll say it this way, a residence in a couple of different places. So can you tell me why do you choose to rent? Why do you choose to own? Why do you choose to rent out? Well, Sarah, that's a good question. I've I've asked myself that question (laughs) sometimes. I I think after living in church-provided housing for a number of years, and then coming to the place of deciding where we'd like to live when we retired, we bought a we bought a place for retirement. So that's kind of what why we have a place that we own. But that's in Tennessee. And I'm working in Ohio. It doesn't make sense to buy in Ohio, so I rent a place. I, I lease a place in Ohio so that there's a place that somebody else owns that I live in. And then I can look down the road and one day I've got a place, some another place where I'll go live that I've purchased. I, that's just, so bottom line is I've got a place to retire and I've got a place I'm living. That's really the way it is. But you choose to uh, lease and you've made, you do that for a different reason. Yeah, I've intentionally chosen over the years because most of my experience in ministry has been that there wasn't housing provided by the church. And so I needed to find my own housing. And as someone who is not married and my income is the work that I do for the church, I never wanted to be in a place where I had a mortgage payment that I was paying, and then I was asked to move someplace else, and I was moving into a parsonage, and so I didn't have that the financial resources to be able to pay that mortgage. And so for me, it was, it was a matter of practicality that I don't want to get stuck in a place that I don't have the resources for the home that I have purchased. So I guess it was a financial decision, practical decision for me. And if I'm really super honest, I don't want to have to take care of the lawn, the snow removal, (laughs) all of the things that if something breaks, I choose not to have that occupy my time, space, and finances. Our last episode, we introduced the idea of stepping into the arena So I've got to ask this question since we started talking about renting or owning. What's that have to do with stepping into the arena? So how about I answer that question for you after you remind our listeners what they can expect for the next five weeks? See, that's what I get for asking questions, isn't it? Throughout Lent, we're exploring a series of five questions designed to enhance whatever you're already doing or what you've already planned for this Lenten season. We're calling this series, Step Into the Arena. Every week, we'll explore one question with stories and illustrations and leave you with a challenge that you can practice in the midst of your everyday, ordinary life. To accompany this podcast series, you can join us inside the private Facebook group for the Hope of Lament, that each week we'll reflect on one psalm using the question we offer on the podcast. You can find the link to the Facebook group on the show notes page at transformingmission.org forward slash 109. Now, Sarah, what does renting and owning have to do with stepping into the arena? So today, the question that we're going to introduce you to invites us to move from seeing ourselves as owners to being stewards. And if we're going to step into the arena and show up as daring and courageous leaders, we need clarity. So our first question helps us to get clear about the people that God has placed in 
our midst. So we've got five questions, and this is question number one. Our last episode was an introduction to this, right? So here's our first question. So our first question is, who are the people entrusted to your care? I'm going to say that again. Who are the people entrusted to your care? As leaders who want to follow Jesus every day where you live, work, and play, we want you to consider who are the people entrusted to your care? So it's like we're being stewards of people? Exactly. (laughs) So think for a minute what we talked about at the beginning in terms of renting versus owning. An owner has the ability to rent. A renter, on the other hand, is a steward of space or equipment. So in a very real way, an owner is in a position of power. A renter is committing to space, equipment, opportunity for a season. So you've probably rented a storage facility for a short term or you were doing something on your lawn and maybe you needed to rent a tool to till the ground before you planted spring flowers. You didn't own those things. And often if there was damage, whether to that storage space or to that tool or equipment, there's going to be a cost. But if you own it, you bear the cost up front. So I remind you of that for this reason. We thought about if there was another way to ask this question, who are the people entrusted to your care? We wondered if the question, who are you called to serve, might be another way to ask it. But the reality is, even when we're serving with people, we've made a decision to serve. The people that are entrusted to your care implies that God is entrusting us with something. In this case, someone, a group of people, that we have the privilege, I would say, to care for. And so that means that we're God's co-workers. Sarah, I I say this too often, but that's super cool. (laughs) I mean, that's a major difference. The idea of deciding who we're going to serve as opposed to receiving who God has given us to care for. And for me, when I think about It's almost as if God offers an invitation. Sarah, will you care for, I'm going to say it this way right now, will you care for the pastors in the Capital Area South District? Now, if I'm a brat, I'm going to say no. (laughs) (laughs) This is Wednesday. It's the day you care. But I'm not. That's who God has entrusted in my care. The people who are listening to this podcast, I feel as though God has entrusted you to our care. That's an invitation. And so to me, that becomes a place that I can say, wow, God, you're, you're asking me to do that? Thank you for this privilege to be able to use the gifts that I have in this way, to care for this group of people in this time and space. That's a whole different approach than, who's God calling me to serve? Well, I want want to serve the people, I mean, if we're really honest, we want to serve the people who think like us, who look like us, and who act like us, because we're human. And so that becomes a very selfish statement. And so this idea of being God's co-workers, there's beauty and there's messy stuff in the midst of that. Absolutely. We're going to get into that. I'm, I'm getting ahead of us. No, I, I, you've gotten me excited about what you're talking about. I, it, there's a huge difference, but yet in the church or, and I think in other organizations too, we decide who we're going to serve. Even though we might say everyone's welcome, even though we say we love everybody, even though we say we care, if we are in the controlling seat, we decide who we're going to serve. I think we found a scripture might help here, 1 Corinthians 3. Yeah, that- before you go there, though, Tim, let, let me say this. You hinted at it. I'm just going to say it bluntly. 
So I said, who has God entrusted to my care? And I'm pointing to pastors and people listening to this podcast. But what you hinted at is this is a question that whether you are serving in a paid ministry position or whether you're working at Panera Bread or welcoming people at Walmart or delivering somebody's mail or picking up somebody's garbage or the person who manages this whole complex that I live in, you can answer this question. So this isn't just for pastors to answer. This is a question for everyone. You might be a parent who stays at home full time with your kids. Who's God entrusted to your care? Your children. You might be a youth leader, and I'm not talking about a youth leader in the church. I'm talking about a youth leader with a community organization. Who's entrusted to your care? I want to broaden how you're hearing this question because it's not simply for pastors. This is a question for everyone who who says that they want to follow Jesus. Okay, now to the scripture, 1 Corinthians. Which is good for everyone who hears it, and not just necessarily those in the church. And hopefully this enhances what you're doing for the Lenten season. This is 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6. It happens in the midst of divisions in the church, and Paul points out something that uh, we as leaders need to remember. We're stewards, not owners. Here's the scripture. I planted... Apollos watered, but God made it grow. Because of this, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. But the only one who is anything is God who makes it grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together, but each one will receive their own reward for their own labor. We are God's co-workers and we are God's field. God's building. So what we're saying is being God's co-workers then today, we want to invite you to consider some things. I'm just going to repeat what Tim has already said and what I've said before. Be a steward and not an owner. And in that, remember that in that scripture that Tim just read, God is the one who initiates the action. We're the stewards. And God's saying to us, these are my people. <laughs> will, will you care for them? And then third, consider what effect the work that you are doing has on the people entrusted to your care. So let me ask that question again. Who are the people entrusted to your care? Really, what we're saying, aren't we, is that our hope is that everyone's thinking about who you have the opportunity to be a steward with for this season. Who do you get to plant and to water? Is is that what we're talking about? Okay, I'm just going to ask this question. How do you plant and water people? (laughs) I just ask you that question. (laughs) So how, how I would answer that is to say, be present in the midst of the crazy, the beautiful, the tough stuff, be present in the midst of life and think more about who God is entrusting to your care than what God is. And I want you to hear me clearly with an emphasis on what God is calling you to do. And I emphasize that because recently I read the statement and it made me pause. And the statement was, God calls leaders not to a task, but to a people. Sarah, say that again, because I think that is, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, that's cool too. (laughs) The statement was, God calls leaders not to a task, but to a people. So I've spent all of my ministry talking about God calling me to preach or God calling me to teach. I went through a process where I was asked if God called me to be a bishop. What you're telling me is, and what I'm hearing is, that God might not be calling me to a task as much as to the people God's entrusting me to. I think you've just identified what our challenge might be. So what changes if you're called to a people and not to a task? 
your motivation changes, your reason changes. For me, my my whole why is animated in a different way. And how I would say it, because I use this metaphor a lot with with coaching, especially coaching Christian leaders, God's in the driver's seat. I'm just in the passenger seat. And God's inviting me into something. Then I consider the impact of my work on the people entrusted to my care. It's not about a task to be done, another sermon to write, or another podcast to edit, or another blog to to publish, or another post on social media, or I need to run to the grocery store, or (laughs) I need to make that phone call. It's about faithfully responding to who God is inviting you to be and who God is entrusting to your care. Does that make sense? Do you hear the shift? Do you hear the difference in what I've offered there? I'm going to answer for everybody and say I do. But let me say, I haven't said this for a while. I'm in my 46th year of ministry. I wish that somewhere earlier in my ministry, I had had this kind of insight. Now, it doesn't mean that I've not cared for people. And it doesn't mean that I haven't put people in the center at times. But I have spent almost all of my ministry task-oriented and not people-oriented. And I'm beginning to wonder, when I say that out loud, if that might not be part of the problem we have in the world today, is that we've been, we've been so focused on tasks and issues and positions and, and not upon people that we've kind of missed what God would really have us do. Does that, am I, are you my therapist at this moment? <laughs> no, so you, you all can't see what we're seeing, but we're both smiling right now. And why I'm smiling is what, what I'm thinking, Tim, is in the work that I do with Clifton Strengths in the United States, the number one most frequent talent of over 23 million people, it might be 24 million now, who have taken the Clifton Strengths assessment when they get their top five, the number one talent in the United States is achiever. And you know what that talent is all about? It's all about task. It's about getting things done. Now, getting things done, it needs to happen. But if that is the mentality, and if that's the driving force, and if that is what is most prevalent, and I think about what you just said, it's all around us. It's what is, quote unquote, normal. It's what people see. The the people, the people relationships and the importance of people in the midst of the tasks, that comes down a little bit lower. So before we go down that rabbit hole, let's move on to the the challenge for this week. But I think you hit on something important there. And I just offer the piece about the achiever talent as a bit of evidence. That's the reality that that we're dealing with. And so what might happen if the leaders who are listening to this podcast began to model for people a different way and help people to imagine something that could be different in a new way. And there was a focus on the people. So that's why we care. So this week, here's our challenge for you. And to help you reflect and act on your response to this question, who are the people entrusted to your care? And Tim said it, and I'll say it again. We really want this series to come alongside whatever you're already doing, whether it's during Lent or at another time, to come alongside your everyday life. So we're going to walk you through a series of questions, and I'm going to invite you to hit pause on how whatever you're doing and however you're listening to this podcast after each of the questions to really be able to name them and experience them. Now, if you are driving, don't don't stop and write in the midst of in the midst of driving. Please just listen to the podcast and then come back to the questions after. I'll mark the time spot in the show notes so that you can jump right to it. Tim, you want to give us the first question? Who are the people whom God has entrusted to your care? And what we'd ask you to do is to name them, write them down, or right now get a face in your mind and a name on your lips. You have somebody 
for whom you care. And what's the second question? What effect do you want your work to have on the people who are entrusted to your care? Just to model for the people who are listening, I'm going to answer the first question in terms of who are the people entrusted to our care. I'm going to say our podcast listeners. Tim, what effect do you want our work of this podcast to have on the people who are listening? I want them to be Jesus followers in such a way that the world changes. And as we talk about focusing in on leaders, I would really want the effect of our work to equip leaders, to equip others, to be Jesus followers. So the world can be what and who the, God created the world to be. And we've talked about this around relationships. We've talked around uh, uh, today about caring. How cool would it be that we could actually care for one another? Yeah. And, and so the only thing that I can't add to what you said, because it's what you want, but how I would answer that is very similarly with the simple addition of, I want people to follow Jesus every day. I want us to shift from participating simply in a church service on Sunday to seeing and experiencing Jesus every single day. That following Jesus is who we are, and that we're helping you as leaders to help other people be able to do that. So, you're not going to answer the question the way that Tim and I just answered it, because you're not talking about podcast listeners. <laughs> you're not talking about this podcast. The people who are entrusted to your care are a different group of people. I just wanted to do that so that you could get a sense of what are we talking about when we ask that question. So with those two questions as bookends, if you will, you have the people who are entrusted to your care on one end, and the other bookend is what's the effect do you want your work to have on the people who are entrusted to your care? I want you to now consider these questions. What are you thinking about the people who are entrusted to your care? And I just want you to focus on your current thoughts. One sentence. This is not a dissertation. This is not even a chapter in a book. This is not even a paragraph. It's just one sentence. What are you thinking about the people entrusted to your care? And if you're in a place to do so, I want you to write it down. The next question is, what are you feeling about the people entrusted to your care? And how I talk about feelings with people is what's the vibration in your soul? And I want you to just name one word. So if you start writing a sentence, that's a thought. What are you feeling? So this is the place where you say, I'm frustrated, I'm excited, I'm energized, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm mad, I'm glad. I could go on and on with feelings, but just one word, name that and write that down. And then the last question is, what action is God inviting you to take? So that effect of your work that you named is really focused on where God's moving and where God's leading you and the people that are entrusted to your care. So what action is God inviting you to take? Go ahead and write that down. And what I want to say to you is if when you wrote that down, your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions, and you got to the actions and you went, yeah, there's not alignment here <laughs> in terms of what I'm thinking and feeling and the effect that I really want to have and what God's asking me to do, it's time to reckon with what's going on and start digging in or peeling back the onion, if I can use that metaphor, of what thoughts need to shift. And it might be that you're consumed by criticism because you're in a place right now that doesn't have a culture of feedback. And what you're hearing is people being critical of you. And what I can tell you from the work that I do around Dare to Lead, that's leading to shame and it's leading you to self-protect. And so you're not open to what is happening. That is a human response. That is not a judgment. It is a reality of who we are. So 
if you have a shame storm brewing in your head about the effect of your work on the people entrusted to your care, it might be that you've been so focused on a task that you've forgotten the people in your midst and who God has entrusted to your care. And so then again, another shame storm starts to brew. Or perhaps your thoughts are always healthy and whole. Wonderful. (laughs) Move on to the next question. What feelings need to shift? And here I would ask you to consider, is the emotion that you named, do you see that as a positive or a negative? Don't get wishy-washy here on me. Just name it as a positive or a negative. If you're frustrated, that's negative. We don't want to be frustrated. God doesn't want us to be frustrated. If you're happy, that's a positive emotion. That's a life-giving thing. So is what you identified in the previous question around your thoughts impacting how you're feeling? And here's what I'm going to say to you. It is. So play dress up for just a moment. Try on a different thought. And remember, you're a steward of God's creation. So if what you're feeling in the moment is criticized, and hear me, folks, there likely are people who are being critical. I'm not denying that fact. Again, it's it's our human nature. But what happened? What would happen if you started to think, you know what? This person is being critical and there's nothing that I can do about their criticism. But what I can do is how I react to that criticism. And if this is someone who is entrusted to my care, what's the most loving thing that I can do in this moment to help them understand that what I'm hearing is criticism, and so I'm not able to hear the feedback? Can we try that again? I think we've called that a rumble, haven't we, Tim? We have, yes. So. There are people entrusted to your care who need value and anticipate experiencing the presence of God with you. If your feelings are negative and um, not God-centered, perhaps the question and what you need to try on and play dress up in this moment is, how do you want to feel about the people entrusted to your care? Do you want to love them? And folks, I'm asking that question because there have been moments in ministry that I have had to stop myself and say, you know what, I'm at a place right now that I don't want to love these people because it takes effort. Was that a selfish statement and a selfish moment in my mind? Absolutely it was, but it was the reality of what I was feeling. There have been other moments that absolutely I wanted to love the people that were entrusted to my care. And I did everything that I could. And in that loving, I poured out everything that I had, and there was nothing left of me. And neither one of those are healthy places to be. That's just a Sarah opinion, perhaps a little bit of meddling. Finally, the the last question is, do you need to shift any of your actions? What do you need to stop doing or start doing? Perhaps you've been sitting in the driver's seat. Perhaps you've been that owner trying to control what is happening. And the action that you need to take is to sit in the driver's seat so that God can be the actor and you can be the steward. Man, you've stirred up a lot of thoughts for me. I've got two things I want to say, and I'll try to do them quickly. One of the things that stirs up with me is this doesn't have to pertain to the church. And that's what we said early on. It could be any place that we are, anywhere that we've been given the opportunity to care. And I think one of the things that happens in our culture is that in a job where we're employed may not be the place where we think about caring. But I saw this at a grocery store recently. It was an elderly man. He was not well-dressed. I mean, he was all wrinkled. He was disheveled. He was having trouble with the self service checkout machine. The clerk came over to help. And she was kind of curt, short with him. It, you know, it was it was obvious that he was a bother to her. But when he finished, he looked at her and thanked her. I appreciate you helping me. He said something like that. And her response was, I'm going to say, came out of a task. She said, it's my job. And he said, but it was me that you helped. 
And I know he didn't hear her when he walked down, but there was a transformation. Because when he walked by, she said, that was nice. That was good. That's somewhat of an example of what we're talking about. Yeah. Moving from from task to caring, and God will show up in a way to remind us if we're really trying. So God uses an old man to do that. Yeah, the story that you just named, Tim, is a wonderful example of shifting the thinking. Right. Yeah, you know, We don't know what she was really thinking, but in your story, if I were to name, she was thinking about a job. She was thinking about that task. But he called to mind that he is a person, he is a human, and he has value. And his very presence in her midst, by her helping, led to, led to that transformation and led to her feeling and experiencing her work in a different way. My guess is that simple action is going to lead her to respond differently to the customers who are in that line having difficulty the next time. And maybe the next time he shows up in in that checkout line and he runs into trouble again, there will be a different interaction that happens between him and her. That's transformation. (laughs) And, And so for her, when I think about the question for this week, who are the people entrusted to your care? For someone who is working the self-checkout lane at the grocery store, it's the customers. Those are the people who are entrusted to your care. So that's what we want you to practice this week. Whether you go through all of the questions that, that Tim and I have walked through in the second half of this podcast or not, what we really want you to do is practice answering the question, who are the people entrusted to your care? Answer it before stepping into a meeting answer it before the start of a Bible study, answer it before returning a phone call, answer it before preparing to preach, answer it before you punch the clock and step into that checkout line to serve the people who are the customers at the grocery store. Because when you do, you'll step into the arena aware of who God has entrusted to your care and focused on the effect of your work and what it has on the people entrusted to your care. Well said. So once again, I'll remind you that you can find show notes for this episode, including a link to the Facebook group where we're exploring the hope of lament alongside this question for this week, who are the people entrusted to my care? You can find that at transformingmission.org forward slash 109. So go lead a movement of Jesus followers. Bye for now.